so thank you for joining the April Physics Matter Colloquium and for following our uh, typical and uh, topical forum related to popular science and innovation based on neutron and light source. The primary around the sesame light source in Jordan, but also and more about uh, the basic science for sustainable development. So this colloquium so is prepared by the Forum on International Physics, uh, the FIP at the American Physical Society, in the framework of the program Physics for Development. So our live online colloquia series is designed to primarily target developing and developed communities, but also anyone interested by science. So the panelists today, so we have, uh, uh, so my name is uh, Christine Dar. So I work at European Spallation Source in Sweden, in Lund, and I'm the chair also of the Forum of International Physics. We have with us, so the Johnny Mela, who is the past chair of the FIP, and last but not least, the mother founder of the series, Luisa Ciparelli, who is connecting from Bologna University. So engaging in science and physics so as a vector for development. So that's our goal with the Forum of International Physics, but for all of us, I would say. So this series has been conceived in the middle of the pandemic, so by Luisa, so with the purpose to reach and engage developing and developed community by inspiring topic in the field of science. So we want to promote international collaboration and to tackle the quest for physics curiosity. So in our webpage, you can find much more recording by renowned until, uh, international scientists uh, showing why the physics is really mattering for all of us. So we recall that Sweden is <coughs> an observer member of the SESAMI and uh, especially the Max 4 light source operating here in Lund. So in March 22, we had an excellent presentation of Sweden. So with Professor Karl Anström, who describe why physics matter with artificial intelligence, natural and artificial cognition AI. So today for a more sustainable goal, so we will wear our neutron and X-ray glasses to be transported to the magic of materials. So with a Professor Alexandra Matic. So Alexandra Matic is a professor of physics and head of the division for material physics at the Chalmers University of Technology in Göteborg in Sweden. His research interests span from fundamental and soft matter to applied research on material for energy application. And the particular focus is material for new generation batteries, for instance, the lithium sulfur battery, nanostructured carbon material, interface engineering with lithium matter, matter, um, metals or the surface, and development on ionic liquid based electrolysis. So he has also a strong interest in the use of uh, development of large facilities, so like uh, uh, synchrotron X-ray or neutron scattering. So we will uh, now let uh, you the flow by knowing that you it's better to <coughs> the question in the little question and answer um, box, which is at the end uh, at the bottom of your screen, or to write them as well in the chat, and we will uh, describe them at the end of the presentation. So, Alexander, so I leave uh, the screen to you. Yeah, so thank you very much, Christina, and uh, also thanks to Luisa and Josef for uh, arranging the seminar series. And it's really an honor uh, to be here. Uh, so uh, my name is Alexander Matic, and uh, I am in Göteborg, Sweden. So it's a lovely spring day outside, more or less like in my uh, background behind me. Uh, and the topic for today is the role of large scale facilities for battery research and innovation. So these are the, I, I really merge two topics, which I, uh, is very close to my heart uh, and, and part of my, my research. So it's not only any type of large scale facilities, but it's really how we use uh, the large scale facilities for uh, neutron and X-ray experiments uh, to drive uh, material science uh, forward uh, in order to uh, develop new batteries uh, for a sustainable future. And you see here a collection of, uh, of different uh, facilities around the world with synchrotrons, uh, neutron sources uh, that are really hubs uh, for innovation. And as Christina says, we will put on our neutron eyes, our X-ray eyes, and then uh, look into the 
into materials for for batteries. So these facilities are are there for for material science, and it's it's really a the the, the strength of them lies in the fact that uh, you can go over the whole length scale from fundamental excitations of the Ångström length scale and all the way to investigating uh, devices of uh, millimeters or even up to meter length scale. And the, the subjects we cover are, are physics, chemistry, material science and engineering, but with also with the relevance to all the uh, different issues we have in society today with uh, with health, with environment, with energy uh, technology, and a lot has happened. Uh, I give I give on the right here some examples. Uh, I mean, we have the first uh, insights in how you could use X-rays with the imaging uh, uh, by Röntgen of uh, his wife's uh, hands. A very simple experiment, but now, a long time after after this. We really do advanced things. We solve protein structures. We can image, here is for instance, a drug formulation. This is a detailed image of a collagen distribution in bone. And down here is the, the position of lithium metal in a lithium uh, metal battery. So we can, all, we can go over very many different subjects and on very many different length scales and solve many problems with these facilities. So, so one of the analogies we, we typically do here is that we, <clears throat> we view these facilities as, as Swiss army knives because they're not solving one problem for us, but they, they have the knife, they have the scissors, they have the screwdriver uh, to, to address the particular problems we have irrespective of if the, it comes from uh, biology, energy technology, uh, or or physics, and all these gives us uh, really the ability to look look into materials in details, and understand their functionality all the way from the atomic structure, over the morphology, uh, linking this to the dynamics, how things move, and in the end, of course, we want to understand the functionality. Uh, so we can. And not only we look into materials, we can actually see what the materials are doing also in working devices. So here to the right, uh, depicting uh, we have put on our neutron eyes and we look into uh, uh, espresso, uh, the espresso machine, and we can really see how the espresso is, uh, how the water is coming, going through the coffee and uh, assembling in the top. So it's just a very simple demonstration to also say that what we can do is we can actually look into devices while they're working, uh, which means we, that we can understand uh, how products work. We can look at materials in operation or we can follow, um, follow processes. And the typical, uh, here is the layout of, of two facilities uh, then in Sweden. So of course, since I'm in Sweden, I have to take this as example. Uh, to, the, to the left here, we have the synchrotron the MAX4 facility. So this has been now in operation since 2016 and has now 16 beam lines uh, accepting in the, in the user program, uh, offering really cutting edge um, uh, capabilities uh, to the scientific community. So each one of these instruments uh, on the list uh, around, around the two rings at MAX4 uh, has a certain uh, capability to address uh, the atomic structure, what is the chemistry of my material, which processes occur, how can I study biomolecules and so on. Uh, similarly, we have the European Spallation Source, so where Christine is working, uh, which is uh, yet under construction, uh, but in, uh, in a few years uh, will uh, we'll also accept users. And similarly there, we have instruments to study surfaces, uh, to image materials, to look at biomolecules, to look at materials under extreme conditions. So really we have these uh, Swiss army knives. From the beginning, these facilities mainly addressed uh, a physics community and came from the curiosity of physicists to understand the fundamental processes. But more and more, uh, we see how these facilities contribute uh, uh, to society. And I think one of the really uh, nice examples is what happened during COVID when uh, all the facilities had to close because uh, or to, to close the user program 
uh, due to uh, restrictions, they could still work and address uh, the pressing issue to understand the, the coronavirus. And here are two examples of research from Max4, uh, where they, ident where they uh, contributed to research on COVID. But this was also uh, done by many, many other facilities. And in fact, we see today a, a trend where these facilities are more and more used to actually directly contribute to the development of society, to tackle global challenges uh, with these research infrastructures. So this is about sustainability, uh, about health, and uh, about energy, three of the main global challenges in, uh, in, uh, in our so society. So today, I want to link what we can do with these uh, facilities uh, to battery research and innovation. And actually battery research today is a lot about tackling global challenges because they will be one of the key technologies uh, that will underpin the transition to sustainable transport, to sustainable electricity production, and thereby solving a lot of the energy issues we have in the world. So we might think that uh, the problems with uh, how we use energy uh, is new, but in fact, this is a really, really uh, a long story. So to the left here, uh, you have uh, King Edward uh, of, uh, of England, because already in the 13th century, you had uh, huge smog problems uh, in the London area uh, due to that deforestation, uh, due to deforestation, people started to burn uh, bad quality sea coal. Uh, which is a very inefficient process, with, which led to a lot of uh, pollutants. So in, instead of, uh, as we do today, provide some kind of incentives uh, to, to make a transition of technology, what he did, um, he said that if you don't follow, if you continue to burn sea and coal, uh, sea coal, I will uh, uh, expose you to pain of torture and death. Unfortunately, that didn't work because you can see in the later picture, this is uh, one of the great smogs in 1873 with uh, more than uh, 300 deaths uh, due to bronchitis during smog. Next image is 1952, uh, maybe around uh, 12,000 deaths also in great smog. And th this gave some response in society, but mainly what happened was that one was uh, relocating industries and power outside the city, not really solving the problem. And one can see that we have not learned so much. Uh, to the right, we have a picture from Shanghai uh, where you can see clearly the smog uh, from, from a hotel window. Uh, where is it interesting? Because when I show these to Chinese colleagues, they always tell me, oh, it's really a nice day in Shanghai. You can see the sky. Uh, coming from countries with maybe slightly less pollution in the cities, uh, we think that this is terrible. So this is uh, really something we have to counteract. And, not only by moving industries outside of the cities, but really introducing sustainable technology. And one such uh, measure has already been, been, been taken. We see a, a big transition uh, from combustion-based uh, vehicles to, uh, uh, to electric cars. Um, and we also see the transition uh, towards uh, green electricity production with solar cells and uh, and with, um, with wind energy, for instance. But one thing which all these uh, technologies require is, is actually an energy storage and developing more efficient energy storage uh, systems, but also systems which in themselves are sustainable is then suddenly becomes uh, one of the big, uh, big challenges. And you already know that with all the electric vehicles, uh, we are introducing batteries as our energy storage system. And batteries are, have now really become uh, part of our, of our uh, everyday life. Starting somewhere in the, uh, at, the, at, the, at the beginning of this millennium with consumer electronics, uh, this has now completely exploded. And I, I just calculated that every day uh, going to work, I think I carry something like six or seven uh, batteries with me uh, all the time in my iPad, in my smartwatch, in my phone, 
in my laptop and so on. We have them in power tools. We see them in electric cars, electric buses, and they are also now appearing uh, in, uh, in grid energy storage and uh, energy storage and balances. And all this is actually thanks to um, the invention of the lithium ion battery. So lithium ion battery uh, is what we are using in almost all of our uh, products today, electric cars, electric buses, and all the uh, consumer electronics. And the big invention here was to be able to reversibly uh, cycle a cell. Primary batteries we had the tons of. Uh, we had uh, also some rechargeable batteries like the nickel cadmium, nickel metal hydride, but the lithium ion technology uh, is so more efficient and gives out so much more energy, which means that we can get uh, light components, which last for a very long time. And here, here is the working principle. So it's in, in, in some sense, it's very similar, uh, simple on the anode side. So in the charge state, you will have all your lithium ions uh, stored inside graphite. So you know that uh, graphite is uh, uh, these uh, one dimensional carbon layers stacked on top of each other where there is just enough room uh, for the lithium ion uh, to go in and uh, be, be super comfortable. On the other side, we similarly have uh, a cathode material which is a transition metal oxide. So we have a transition metal which has the ability to change the valence and in this way it compensate for the lithium ion uh, uh, coming in. So at discharge, we take the lithium ions, we go through the electrolyte, and we store them in the cathode material. And the cathode material from the beginning was the lithium uh, cobalt oxide, which has a really nice capacity. We can get nice reversibility with graphite and lithium cobalt oxide. For the future, of course, and we will get back to that, uh, maybe we need to think about which materials we use, and this is something already addressed today, because cobalt is not so environmentally friendly. And so on. The invention of the lithium ion battery was uh, recognized in 2019 uh, by the uh, Nobel Prize awarded to Yoshino, Goodenough, and, and Whittingham for pioneering uh, this uh, technology. And uh, on bottom left, you can see the prototype, or one of the prototypes that Sony developed in, in 1983. And so you can see that. Developing such a technology and refining it to the performance it has today really takes time. Uh, the first paper papers uh, appeared already in the 60s and 70s uh, by Goodenough and Whittingham. Uh, down here is an example of one of the papers by Goodenough on lithium cobalt oxide from uh, 19, 1980. And uh, just for you to understand how long time ago this is, this is actually how the paper looks inside. You see it's typed basically on a, on a, on a typewriter if anybody understands uh, what that even means. And the same technology that was developed uh, uh, in, the, in the 1980s by Yoshino, Goodenough and Whittingham, this is more or less what we use today. We use a cell uh, with graphite on one side and a transition metal oxide on the other side. Uh, it is not fundamentally different from that. What has developed a lot is how we use the materials, how we do the engineering of the cell. And you can see that with the same base technology, we have actually increased the performance of the cell almost three times. Going from something like even in the beginning less than uh, 100 watt hours per kilo, which is the way that we measure the energy density of lithium ion cells. Uh, today, actually the best cells, so you see this graph stopped in 2008 and are now projected where we are today. We are somewhere here off the chart with cells approaching something like 300 uh, watt hours per kilo. Um, so we have refined the technology learned how it works. And a lot of this is thanks to understanding the processes and uh, uh, the materials uh, to increase the capacity, increase the cyclability so they can uh, long uh, run for a long time in a very efficient way. So what we see here 
with the with the now the new demand saying that all vehicles should go to electric vehicles uh, we have the demands on uh, energy storage uh, in uh, in uh, smart grids for instance and then all the explosion also of consumer electronics there is a huge increase in demand uh, in terms of volume of batteries uh, how much batteries we need and it's projected to 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 just increase in the coming years, almost exponentially. At the same time, uh, you can here see to the right, uh, the, the top light blue, um, no, sorry, the, yes, the, you can, you can see how, um, uh, how the volume weight uh, per, per pack and the cell price has actually decreased. So if you look here at the, at the cell price, uh, kilowatt hours, uh, uh, dollar per kilowatt hours, has dramatically decreased uh, as technology has developed. And this has actually enabled us to uh, implement uh, this technology. Uh, if we would still be on the two th 2013 prices for cells uh, today, uh, our cars would be immensely expensive. But note here, uh, it's just one data point, but uh, you can see that there is actually an increase in price uh, in the last years. And this, this is uh, due to the uh, uh, very much increased uh, demand of, of batteries, making it a competition for them. So not only is there an increasing demand of, uh, of, uh, of volume, of the amount of batteries, but also performance, mainly driven by uh, uh, new applications. So in the, in the last 10 years, we have seen the increase of uh, electric cars, and we have seen the increase of demand on driving range and so on. But now we also want to go to electric buses, electric trucks, and so on. Similarly, very large scale installations for, um, uh, for the power, for power generation uh, is being, ha have been launched uh, throughout the world. Uh, also increasing, uh, putting new demands of performance. And nowadays, for sustainability reasons, we are discussing, can we go from combustion engines in uh, airplanes to fully electric uh, machines there as well? Down here is an example of a Swedish company called Hart Aerospace, which want to, so they are in the process of developing these kind of uh, medium-sized uh, uh, airplanes uh, that can uh, very well serve uh, regional uh, demand uh, for flights. So what happens then is that all the time we see uh, increase in uh, demand on energy, energy density, power, how far can we charge, uh, life length, because, which is uh, tightly coupled to the, to the lifetime cost of a battery, safety of course, if we want to have them in uh, vehicles or even planes, we want it to be super safe, and also of course sustainability. The actual materials we use must be sustainability, sustainable, both from a raw materials perspective, but also from a production point of view. So there is a push by all these new applications uh, to also develop new battery technology. So the response to the sheer demand on volume is also a growing industry. So this is a map taken, um, created in uh, September last year of uh, production facilities, of new production facilities in, uh, in Europe. So if we just go back a few years, the main, all the main producers were in Asia, uh, whereas now we have a big establishment of uh, production facilities uh, around Europe. And I can see directly from the Swedish side that, that we need to update this, uh, this map with a couple of more points. And I'm sure it's the same in, in all other countries. So we have also a growing industry, which uh, then we need also to support with technology development and so on uh, for the competitiveness. But as I said, we have so far worked a lot uh, the success of, of the implementation of, of batteries for energy storage in vehicles and in the smart grid has been due to the, uh, the lithium ion battery and this graphite transition metal oxide cell. 
But actually, we are rapidly approaching uh, the theoretical limit for this. So we also need to look at uh, new technologies. For instance, one very straightforward way would be to replace uh, graphite with lithium metal, uh, which immediately would uh, enhance the energy density. You can go to high voltage materials like these high nickel content, nickel uh, manganese uh, cobalt oxides. Uh, you can go to completely new chemistries like the lithium sulfur chemistry, enabling you to reach maybe towards five, 600 watt hours per kilo. So that means we will have uh, batteries uh, which can drive our cars longer or uh, simply have longer discharge and so on at a certain power. So when we look into next generation batteries, from a sustainability perspective, we would really like to have the active uh, material to be something else than lithium. Even though lithium is not super scarce, uh, there are materials which are much more uh, um, uh, abundant and also which are distributed around the world in a much more uh, even way. So for instance, the dream would of course to be uh, to go to sodium batteries. And today there are actually the first sodium ion batteries coming uh, on the market. Similarly, we can think about magnesium or zinc or something like this. This would increase mainly the sustainability, but in some cases, also we can improve the capacity. Today we're using liquid electrolyte in all our batteries, but what if we could have a solid material which could transport ions as fast? Then we could create solid state batteries. These would inherently be much safer and we could also there increase the capacity of, of such cells. I talked about going to completely new chemistries, for instance, uh, lithium sulfur or even sodium sulfur, which could maybe double the capacity uh, compared to current, um, uh, current technology. So there is a lot of things we can improve in the future. And when we look at the research that needs to be done, uh, it's not one thing we need to look at. We really need to understand everything uh, from atom all the way up to the final battery cell. So there are processes there from the atomic arrangement, the elementary excitation, over to how the particles of active materials are built up, how they change during cycling, how you assemble a whole electrode. An electrode is a composite material. There is, a, there is the active material, there's a polymer binder, and, and there is also a little bit of conductive additive. Uh, how do you get this homogeneous? How does that develop during, during cycling, during the lifetime of a battery? So starting from, from the active material, you want to go to the final device, being at the cylindric battery, which is basically a roll of the different, uh, of the electrode separate, of the two electrodes and the separator, or a prismatic cell, or whichever configuration uh, you like to have. So it's everything from Ångströms all the way up to the macroscopic scale of centimeters uh, that we have to research. And if you look at the challenges, uh, there are everything from understanding surfaces and interfaces in batteries. Here we are on the Ångström to nanometer levels. Bulk materials, so the active materials typically either nanometer sized grains, if we want fast kinetics, to micrometer sized grains uh, with a lot of capacity. How do they work? How do they change? What is the reversibility? What are the thermal properties and so on? Going towards the device level, uh, understanding electrons, homogeneity, reaction mechanisms. Uh, why do they fail? What's the failure mechanism? And then even up to the full device. And also the life, uh, after, how do we recycle our batteries? Uh, also, there goes a lot of, um, uh, we need a, a good understanding for this. Thinking about techniques in that case, uh, the needs are then uh, really different on the different sides. We need surface sensitive techniques to probe uh, the interfaces. Ideally, uh, depth profiling. 
for the bulk techniques, uh, we need to understand the structure of the materials, but also ideally we need to map uh, the distribution uh, of, of such grains and so on. For the electrodes and devices, we want to see what happens and where does it happen uh, uh, in an electrode or in a full cell. Uh, when we have a failure, does it fail everywhere or is it a, a small point which fails? Why does it fail? And similarly to understand material synthesis and recycling, it really requires doing experiments while things are happening. So what we call operando experiments, uh, ideally. In Europe, there is a big research effort uh, to, um, to target um, uh, and drive the development of uh, energy storage and battery technology. And uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is collected in the umbrella called Battery 2030 uh, Plus, uh, led actually by Christina Edström, at, uh, Professor Christina Edström at uh, Uppsala University in, in Sweden. And within this umbrella, there are projects, big projects, uh, uh, gathering the European competence uh, on materials, on analysis techniques, on sensor technology to understand what goes on in the batteries and, and so on. One of the projects that we are part of and uh, which is very interesting is the uh, so-called Big Map project. So this stands for Battery Interface Genome Materials Acceleration Platform uh, with the maybe quite ambitious target uh, that changing the way we do R&D on batteries. So the basic idea is to be able to use uh, computer methods, machine learning and AI in order to accelerate discoveries. But a very important point to this is the input data you have for these methods, uh, for training and for verification of this. You see here, uh, the map of Europe with all the partners in big map. So it, it contains both industry and, um, and academia and, and research uh, institutes. And that what is really the core of these projects is the collaboration and sharing of data and knowledge. And you can find much more uh, both on the big map site, but also a lot of the results you can find on already now on GitHub with uh, with some apps and so on. There is an app store for big map as well. So a central part is actually to to provide operando characterization uh, of of batteries, to provide uh, high fidelity data for testing computer model models and train AI train AI models. So if you look carefully in the list of partners, you can see also three large scale facilities. So two, two synchrotrons, the European synchrotron radiation facility and the Soleil uh, synchrotron, the French uh, synchrotron radiation facility uh, outside Paris and the SRF is in Grenoble. And then you have also the Neutron Source Institute La Langevin uh, in Grenoble, which is also uh, a European um, facility with um, uh, members from um, several different uh, countries. So this, this shows that uh, these facilities directly have an impact and a central point in the, in the research uh, for future battery technology. And if we look a little bit in different uh, techniques, and here is a, a range of generic techniques that you can do uh, in this case first with, with X-rays. So we have, for instance, the absorption spectroscopies, uh, photoelectron spectroscopy, Raman spectroscopy. So here we can provide, for instance, chemical se sensitivity. Uh, we can look in what state are our transition metals, what is actually going on. We have all the different uh, diffraction methods, uh, diffraction and small angle scattering, basically telling us what is the structure and morphology. Uh, and then we have also the, all the tomography and imaging uh, methods. So in this table, we try to indicate uh, if the method you use actually gives you information in 3D, 2D, or if it's a 1D, so, so basically uh, very surface sensitive techniques. And you can also see the, the length scales we cover uh, with the different techniques. If it's a, a green, 
ring around the method. This is also something that you actually can, you can actually do an experiment and follow processes basically in real time. And we will see some uh, examples for this. Similarly, we can uh, uh, make a similar table for neutrons with diffraction, spectroscopy, uh, reflectometry, reflectometry, for instance, to look at interfaces, small angle scattering, and so on. And with all these methods, again, we cover length scales from the Ångström all the way up to the, to the centimeter um, uh, length scale. So you see, we have a large array of versatile tools to directly address the needs we had for battery research, uh, surface sensitive techniques, bulk techniques, image and mapping, and we can do operand experiments. So let's look at some uh, examples. Uh, one recent trend is, is imaging, uh, both with neutrons and x-rays, where we are able to map with all these different techniques, we can actually map a whole material ideally inside the device. And uh, this should be no surprise because we have taken big steps with x-rays since uh, the days of uh, Wilhelm Röntgen's hand uh, to what you today do in hospitals when you go and get a 3D image using x-rays. So actually we can do the same thing with batteries. Here's one example um, of work done uh, at uh, Helmholtz Centrum in Berlin and at uh, ESRF, where they look at the battery cell. In this case, it's actually, it's a, it's a lithium uh, cell, but it's not a rechargeable cell, where they look at both neutro with neutrons and x-rays. And you can immediately see the difference in the contrast because neutrons will have mainly the contrast from the electrolytes, from the hydrogens, whereas X-rays has more the contrast from the heavy elements. So in this case, we have the three electrodes. They are rolled up uh, in this kind of uh, cylindrical sh cell shape. And you can see, we can directly see the different layers. And with cycling, we can follow what happens. In this case, there were signs of delamination, electrolyte drying out, uh, and so on as one of the failure mechanisms. Here's another beautiful example from the Canadian uh, uh, light source. Here they put in what is called the pouch cell. So this looks like a small coffee bag, which contains layers of your, uh, of your electrodes you see here in, in this kind of, uh, of geometry. So here, they actually took a control cell, a pristine one, and then they looked at cell, a cell cycle for two and a half years. So quite extensive uh, uh, cycling. And you see here, here you have the nice homogeneous layers, whereas here you can see uh, that we have some problems with delamination, with some cracking. In this case, they could actually zoom in, uh, you see from the full uh, pouch cell, towards a part of the, of, of the layers, and even down to analyzing individual grains. So really providing this capability to cover uh, large length scales. Here's an example of our own work. Uh, this was done at the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility. So for lithium ion batteries, one of the main degradation mechanisms is that the cell is not able to reversibly store lithium in the graphite. But if you, for instance, have too low temperature or charge your cell too fast, you might uh, plate metallic lithium. So you might deposit metallic lithium uh, on the graphite anode or between the graphite particles instead of allowing time for the particles to enter. So we build this special cell uh, here and could in real time then take 3D images as the cell was cycled. So first we put lithium into the graphite or as you would see, uh, even plate lithium and then we take it out. So here you have the pristine cell and you can see up here, we have the separator. Uh, down here, we have a current collector and here are the graphite particles, all these uh, round uh, small things. These are the graphite particles where we would like the lithium to win. But you can see that with cycling, uh, with time, so approaching somewhere around this point, we see a black layer appearing here. And this is uh, the, actually the, the lithium metal now being deposited on top of the graphite. So you can see here, we can identify some graphite particles, but also huge metallic lithium 
uh, being plated on top of graphite. And this could be done uh, in, in, uh, in real time. On the cathode side, here is a really nice example from uh, Advanced Light Source in, in US, uh, where they use fluorescence X-ray microscopy to follow the lithiation in uh, lithium iron phosphate particles. So through this microscopy, you can actually uh, understand the, the chemical state. So the chemical state while you're inserting lithium into the particle uh, will then give you uh, a sign of how charged it is. So, so here you can see going from zero to 100, you, you basically change, change the color of um, uh, the color map uh, on the on the particle, and this could be done then in a scanning fashion, where you could uh, look at a part of the electrode and understand how the particles uh, were lithiated. And you can see that it's not a homogeneous color scheme, which means that all particles do not respond in the same way. Uh, in the end, we go to the same state. But you can see that uh, some are faster and some are slower to reach that state. Uh, so there is a great inhomogeneity, and this is very important for the engineering and and uh, and design of of the actual cathode and cathode materials. So the materials become more and more complex, <clears throat> and to reach higher capacity, another uh, trend is to mix graphite. Uh, with some uh, some silicon. So silicon has a larger storage capacity than graphite, but the problem is a huge volume expansion. So one tries to make really nice composites uh, that can withstand this uh, nice volume expansion, but still store a lot of lithium. So in this experiment, uh, colleagues from uh, CA in uh, Grenoble, uh, they did experiments with neutrons and X-rays uh, uh, at ILL and ESRF. Uh, where they had a working cell, and then they, def they recorded the diffraction pattern or wide angle X-ray scattering. And from this one, they actually obtained the information on the local ordering uh, in graphite. So they could follow when in the discharge and charge process do we actually store in graphite. And then with small angle X-ray scattering, they could look at the uh, nanoparticles or uh, nanoparticle structures uh, which are signature of the storage of lithium in, in silicon. So then they could actually follow and say, now we have an expansion of silicon and now we are storing more in, in graphite. So they could really differentiate between the, the two uh, mechanisms. So another example here is moving towards lithium metal. And as we said, if we can, uh, use metallic electrodes, we will really increase the capacity. So you see here is the theoretical capacity of graphite and lithium metal is, is more than 10 times of this. And also lithium metal is, is, uh, is really good uh, when you come from Sweden because it was actually uh, discovered by this gentleman, Johan August Arvetson, who was working with uh, Berzelius and he discovered this in uh, 1817. So just to highlight that Swedish uh, invention. And many people say that, oh, lithium, lithium is not good for X-rays because it's a light metal, you cannot, you cannot see it. But actually we proved uh, the, the contrary in this experiment, which we did now at the Swiss light source at Paul Scherer Institute uh, at the Tomcat beamline. So with a specially designed uh, electrochemical cell, we could measure a full 3D tomogram of a working battery uh, uh, in 50 seconds. Uh, with uh, around a micrometer resolution. And here you can see the result where we have a copper electrode and we deposit lithium on top. And you see all these structures are from, from lithium. And we could, we could follow how they actually grow in, in real time, uh, all the time as the, cell, as the cell was was cycled. And in this way, what we could then see was when do we actually form structures which become inactive, which is one of the biggest problems uh, for lithium um, metal batteries, that fragile structures can break off, become electrically isolated, and in this way, uh, stop contributing to the capacity. And here, here is one example. You can see here how these huge uh, 
piece of, uh, of lithium, very porous, is actually formed by merging what we call mossy lithium with uh, lithium dendrite that is formed. And we could look at the dependence, for instance, of uh, what type of electrolyte do you use, uh, what is the charging speed, and, and so on. So the role of facilities in battery research and innovation. Uh, what I see here is that, of course, it is a Swiss army knife. It provides all the capabilities from atom to cell, length scales, time scales, chemical sensitivity. We can actually do the experiments in, in real time. But what they also have, they actually have a critical mass for method development, for developing new methods, new cells that we can use to study our materials. Uh, they have the technological know-how. It's also a very cost-effective way to support uh, user communities and training in methods compared to what we actually do in our home laboratories, uh, where we all develop our own methods and um, the access is not as, as efficiently distributed as in large-scale facilities. In many of the experiments, we also get huge data sets. So for instance, uh, with the tomography, we can easily go away with 40 terabytes from one experiment, which means you actually need resources for data handling and, and how to, to use this data. Also, the data produced as, at these facilities uh, become open after some time. So, and they have the, um, the capability of sharing data. So overall, I think that large scale facilities can actually be a focal point for the community in developing uh, new research, but also for, for innovations. And, and we see the development of new sources. And I exemplify this here by the European Spallation Source uh, being built in Lund in Sweden, but we have also all the new accelerator, uh, the, all the new synchrotrons built like the Max4 in Sweden, where they upgraded uh, ESRF, uh, NSLS2, uh, and so on. And what we get from these are basically bright and small beams. And what we can use this for is, of course, to measure very precise data with unprecedented resolution to study even small changes to, to really Pin down the mechanism. We can use this for high fidelity, but we can also use it for high acquisition rate, which means we can now go towards screening our materials, uh, which I think has been done much more in other fields. If so, if you go, for instance, to, to protein crystallography and so on, where you use robotic systems for sample change and you can go through a large range of materials um, and see which one is best. But we can also follow kinetics, we can follow chemical reactions, or we can use the high acquisition rate to actually do a spatial scanning over our, our, our device uh, and, and use a large range there. And of course, we can go to complex sample environments to do operando uh, characterization. So to, to look at real materials under real conditions uh, in real time. So what we need now for the future uh, for battery research and innovation is of course we need uh, fundamental discoveries and usually they are also tightly coupled to the fact that you develop new capabilities new innovative instruments that can measure new things faster with better resolution um, or in multimodal techniques we also need dedicated sample environments but very very central is to have workflows and data infrastructure so that when a user comes, which is maybe not a specialty user, actually uh, that the threshold for doing ex uh, an experiment is, uh, is smaller. Also, as with all research, complementary infrastructure is super important uh, for battery research that we have facilities close by to the beam lines to assemble our battery cells and to do maybe complementary electrochemical uh, uh, measurements. To do all this, we really need to link academy, industry, and the facilities so that there is a interchange of competences and know-how, uh, user support and training on this, um, on the advanced technique is, uh, is also a central point, as is, of course, access. Because to drive innovations programs, you actually need continuous access, and we will come back to that. So looking what I would really love to see at new facilities, is for instance, for battery research, is for instance, robotics. 
uh, efficient ways of data handling to handle large data sets. On-fly analysis, maybe use AI and machine learning to actually tell me when is my data set uh, good enough. Um, user support, uh, we should leave with reduced data so that we have the result, the scientific result and, uh, and not the data points. Uh, many of the users that come today have limited experience of the actual techniques and they need them to be efficiently trained, uh, which also puts a lot of demand on user friendliness. And continuous access is very important. Uh, to run an innovation program today, uh, you need to know that you will be able to do an experiment and not just maybe. And then it's, it's a question of measurements versus experiments. When new facilities bring on new capabilities, you do experiments, but after a while, after a while these become routine. And it's very important that there is also capacity to do a lot of uh, measurements, to do systematic studies where you explore a large parameter space to find the best material. In the Battery 30, uh, 2030 Plus and the Big Mac project, we are actually approaching uh, all these issues. So we're working a lot with standardization and workflows so that we all are using the same uh, conditions. I can really compare the results we get from different uh, uh, experiments. And we're always striving that operando experiments we do are under as realistic conditions uh, as, um, as, uh, as possible. Also, another thing is to do correlative or multimodal experiments. So ideally, for instance, do Raman spectroscopy and absorption spectroscopy by the same time by bringing in the more lab-based techniques together with uh, uh, at the large-scale facilities. And we're also uh, driving uh, how to access these facilities and training and support. And to end off, I would like to, to, to uh, show an example of an initiative which I think is, uh, is super interesting. So this is the CA in Grenoble, which are today running what they call the battery hub at the ESRF. Uh, this is driven by Sandrine Leonard, who, whose picture you see uh, up to the right. Uh, and of course, CA is, uh, is uh, located in the proximity of ILL and uh, ESRF. Uh, and what they have here is a direct access uh, to beam time so they can really plan uh, long-term projects. So uh, for the, this pilot phase uh, that they have uh, started now, uh, they run this battery hub as a three-year three -year long-term project uh, at ILL and ESRF, uh, which means that they are more or less, have more or less secured beam time uh, for their users. Uh, which they then distribute over different uh, uh, different beam lines, and in this way, they can then run a more um, uh, a research program with much more long long term perspective. But the central of this is actually sharing data methods and access. The members of this hub uh, all share the data that is collected. They also share the knowledge, and they share the access. So if two groups have very similar ideas, they would do this together. And we hope uh, from our Swedish side to, to be part of um, uh, uh, the hub uh, in the future. I think this is uh, a very interesting. Would be very interesting to see if also other facilities could see how they could uh, meet uh, applied research uh, as ESRF has uh, and ILL has done here. So with this time is flying, I would just like to acknowledge the facilities that have given uh, me and my group beam time and of course the, the funding agencies for supporting the research. And uh, where would I be if uh, I did not have my uh, fantastic team uh, here? And you see that uh, the future is so bright for them that many of them have to wear shades. Thank you. What an exciting and inspiring talk. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Wonderful. And we have uh, many questions as well from the audience from, and I, I can recognize quite a few names as well internationally from different research infrastructure. And as you said, the, the focal point for innovation and for the community, I really like, uh, and I would cut that word, for ESS as well, and to connect uh, industries uh, with academy, as you said, and uh, those research infrastructure. Yeah. So thanks a lot, very inspiring. So we will start by some of the questions from the audience. So you can maybe also read them there. We have one hand uh, which is raised. Uh, so 
maybe actually I might, uh, uh, no, it's unraised, so it's okay. So I will start by all the questions. So from uh, the audience. So the first one is which type of X-ray source do you use for material science analysis? And how do you prepare a sample from X-ray analysis in metal science? So it was raised some times ago. So you might have already yeah. back given. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we actually use all of the synchrotrons that we can get our hands of, but we have mainly used ESRF, uh, Swiss Light Source, and, and Soleil at, at this moment. I also see that we, we have our first experiments at MAX4 also, also planned. Uh, it's, it's very different. Uh, depending on what you want to do. And uh, a diffraction experiment is very different from instance for tomography. And, and this is a little bit a challenge. So a sample that you prepare for tomography might look very different for what you prepare for, for diffraction. And this, this, I think, is something that we try to address because if the sample is very different, then maybe your, uh, your result will also depend on that. So it's, it's difficult, unfortunately, to give a very detailed answer uh, in this case, but it will depend on exactly the question you have and exactly the technique uh, you're using. So this is from the point of view of the instrument, but if you wear yeah. the X-ray, so electron gun, for instance, in, in the type of the source itself, it's No, it's a synchrotron. So, so, so I mean, uh, we, we, our work starts when we, uh, when we get X-rays. Voilà. So for you, yeah. it's the X-ray. So the, the rest we will uh, combine later on. Uh, or this we I leave can... to accelerator physicists. Exactly, but we have some of them in the audience. I can tell you as well from Canada, and maybe we can have yeah. the answer there. Yeah. So uh, the next one will be: so how uh, do those facilities enable scientists to better understand the fundamental property and behaviors of batteries material, and how does the knowledge inform so the development of new batteries technology? Maybe then just to summarize, indeed, what you said. Yeah, I mean, that, so, so, so that's really the key point here, that, that uh, you, you have all these instruments, you have all the techniques, so you can really investigate all the different aspects. And, and of course, as with all science, uh, we, we report this in, 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 in literature. The problem is how you translate this uh, to the more applied research maybe taking place in companies. And here I think there is the, the challenge uh, to also introduce them to use these these methods because many of them are uh, in the beginning uh, you can feel that they are very advanced and this is where we have I think the task of um, of training uh, training uh, people in industry to be able to use these methods but actually even more important is to 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 train uh, people at the bachelor master level. Uh, because they will be the ones that are later uh, employed in R and D in in companies. So to introduce uh, knowledge on X-ray methods, X-ray neutron methods, but not only theoretical, to actually enable them uh, students to do experiments uh, during uh, their their education, I think is very important. So to to have, I think today in many study programs, for instance, for material science. It's very common that you have training to do electron microscopy, and uh, I think it would be super if we also could could get many of these students to also come to uh, a synchrotron or a neutron source to actually do a hands-on experiment. Today, with all the digital tools we have, I think we could actually also develop a lot of uh, virtual uh, training stations uh, where you don't actually do the real experiment, but that you work with data and you could even have an interface where it feels like you're controlling, so like a simulator where you could then do your, your experiment. And that would be very interesting to see how we could introduce that in education. Well, merci. So it's, it's a really good uh, information. And as well, I take the advantage to speak about this uh, yeah. uh, as well that we have for, to train teacher as oh. well, for high school, yes. so the scientists for tomorrow. So it's yeah. a collaboration with the Danish and the ESS uh, and the Danish. Yeah. Uh, so then we have uh, more question about, uh, so how might advance in large scale facilities technology impact the future of battery research and invention? Yeah, so this, this I think, so as I said, for fundamental discoveries, it's always like this, that when uh, the facilities, uh, they increase, for instance, the energy of the synchrotron, uh, suddenly they have brighter, more coherent beams, they can do new experiments in new ways. Uh, 
this leads to fundamental discoveries, which we then can exploit in uh, in, uh, in more technology based uh, research, more applied based research. So there, there is one point, but the other point is is really to then take these advanced methods. So if you go back maybe 10 years, then maybe X-ray tomography was quite uh, advanced. Or if you go to even high resolution tomography, like tychography with X-rays, uh, it, it was a super advanced technique. Nowadays, we can actually do measurements of very applied materials. Uh, and the task then for, for the facility is to really have a data pipeline and the, all the data handling in such a way that and so to say a non-expert with the guidance of the Beamline staff can work with the data, reduce their data uh, to a format uh, which they understand. Um, so, so this is the central interplay, which probably puts a little bit more demand and maybe requires slightly more staff at the facilities because to, to support non-experts is, is more demanding than, than uh, supporting uh, people who do this every day. Nice. Um, so then how do the collaboration between research and in academia industry and national lab facilities so facilitate the use of large scale facilities for battery research? So that's a, that's a good point. That's a, that's a, a really good question. Um, we, we have examples, uh, at least here in, in, in Sweden, not in the battery field, but in the field of forest industry, for instance, where we have formed a consortium where academia and industry uh, jointly uh, operate, for instance, a beamline. Uh, in this way, we increase the, the, um, the knowledge in the industry of the methods, but also by having this dedicated beamline, we can also uh, provide much more rapidly beam time. Uh, for experiments uh, and also experiments which more have a technological aspect and are then maybe not as attractive uh, from a scientific point of view, but very important for innovation. So I think forming these consortia where we jointly engage and in, in this way have an efficient knowledge transfer be between academia and industry and, and then the facilities at the center is very important. Then in the end, I, I think the vision should be that many of these techniques should be part of the portfolio of industrial R&D. And this, as I said, I think will only come when we have trained enough people um, on the engineering level so th that will be employed in industry later. Uh, and so they have knowledge of these techniques. Um, when they have this, uh, knowledge, it's part of their portfolio, then they will use this as, as they do with other techniques and simply go in and do proprietary research by beam time and so on. But there is a big part which is about collaboration, bringing together academia and industry uh, to the facilities. And as you mentioned, indeed, like uh, for the case of the SS, the ERIC or those consortium that gather already some, uh, some of the known European, but as well international. Yeah. And the fact that all the data, as you mentioned as well, for all the uh, open access in that sense, so yeah. can be as well yeah. shared in between all those labs. So the importance yeah. of grant and how we can all work yeah, for, for those yeah. purposes. Right. So then, um, so how do large facilities, so this is something, sorry, no, voila, yeah, uh, research <laughs> to study batteries material under different conditions, such as temperature and pressure, so sample environment aspect, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so this 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 is one of I think the the, the big challenges to to get to be able to do experiments under the exactly the relevant conditions, and that this takes a lot of development. And uh, you can always find a model system which you can study, but to study the the actual battery operating, this, this is a big challenge. And I think uh, temperature uh, is is maybe the easiest, but one thing which is really central today is how you regulate the pressure in the cell, uh, which is something that really needs to, to, to be developed uh, in the same way to, to go to the same ratio of, let's say, surface area to electrolyte volume, which uh, that you actually have in the commercial cell. Uh, that is today very challenging, but something that one really needs to, uh, to work towards. And, and this is where 
you need the close collaboration between the people developing beam lines, developing techniques and battery groups. So I, I, I think, for instance, like this battery hub, which has a long term project, they know that over the three years they will have beam time. Then they can also invest a lot of time and resources in actually developing cells, which then they share with the whole community, not only their hub, with, but with the whole community. Yeah, and indeed, uh, this transfer of knowledge and technology as well. So I can also recall for the ESS there between ILL and LLB, two ESS, yeah. uh, those uh, uh, simple environment, uh, high pressure, very high pressure condition yeah. you, you will use as well. Uh, so then uh, next question is, uh, so what sort of limitation and challenges uh, so associated uh, with using large scale facilities for battery research and how does research are working to overcome uh, those uh, issues? So one, uh, one, one practical challenge that we have is, is, uh, is and this I try to uh, touch upon, is the access. Uh, the, the normal mode of working today is you have a propos two proposal rounds per year, you propose, maybe you get your experiment, maybe you don't. So this means you have a turnaround of your experiments like the six months at least in the best case, which is a little bit too slow for, for applied research. Uh, this is why I think we need to form these consortia which have dedicated beam time at facilities, uh, but where we also share in the community, so we have more community-driven uh, projects. Uh, that, that that's on the like access and practical aspect. Uh, when it comes to the actual scientific aspect, I think the biggest challenge is actually to uh, uh, how to get uh, really really relevant uh, conditions and where the conditions that I apply uh, when doing a spectroscopy experiment and an imaging experiment are the same. Ideally, I should actually use the same cell. So that I know that I am uh, having the same response in my system. So this is really important. Going to synchrotrons, we have another thing. They have developed so much uh, and that the beams that we use are so bright today that uh, we always risk of cooking our sample. So how we can reduce beam damage during our experiment is also really a central point so that we don't introduce artifacts by actually doing the experiment. Mm -hmm. Very good, and the background indeed. Uh, um, how does the information obtained so from large scale facilities inform the design of new batteries, material, and structures? Uh, and uh, what way can large uh, scale facilities contribute to the development of safer and more sustainable batteries? I, I think by, by really engaging uh, with the community and industry. Uh, that's that's the only way, and they, they already now contribute. I mean, a lot of the development in in recent years is really underpinned by experiments at at large scale facilities, uh, with, for instance, diffraction and spectroscopy as the main methods. I think now also with the increased imaging capabilities, I, I think we will see this also uh, coming uh, as a more common tool. Uh, for um, uh, for really industrial uh, uh, battery development, and and to ensure that there is efficient knowledge transfer to that the data is 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 open and then can be accessed by by uh, by industry. That open access by industry is very good. Yeah. And I see as well that you have, uh, for instance, the Swedish Energy Agency, Vinova as well, and we have on the other side also from the DOE. Um, I recognize some of the yeah. names. If you had any advice as well for exchanging new industries, that's tricky. IT. No, but I mean, I mean, in 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 Sweden, I think it's probably the same in other countries. We have all these large uh, uh, research programs bringing together industry and and uh, and academia. So in in Sweden, uh, it is the program here based Battery Sweden, where both industry and academia are engaged, and I think. What is then central is to also, since this is a strategic program program funded by 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 the Swedish government through the Swedish Innovation Innovation Agency, it would also be natural to link this then directly to the facility, so that you don't, with one hand, fund battery research and with the other hand, fund fund uh, the facility, and then there is no cross talking. So I think. To, to see if I have a strategic program on, on batteries, maybe I should also directly as a funding agency discuss with the, with the facility what they how they will support this. Uh, and the opposite, ask for the strategic uh, research program 
Uh, how can you exploit the facilities? Make sure that you exploit the facilities and the capabilities there. So a little bit more coordination, at least in Sweden. Maybe in the US it's much, much better. Well, it's, uh, it's uh, good to indeed embrace both uh, different results. So I think it's, uh, it's yeah. less to learn from both. Uh, so can you describe so a specific example on how so a synchrotron radiation source or a neutron source or has been used to advance battery research? I, I, yeah, I think I think uh, several of the cases I I, I showed you has really uh, has really underpinned the understanding, and I, I I think let me let me go to to maybe maybe these these kind of images uh, like this one. So so this one uh, is from the, as I said the Can Canadian light source, and this is also from the from the group of. of uh, Jeff Dunn at Dalhousie University, if I remember correctly, and they are really tightly coupled to to battery development, uh, especially uh, uh, to automotive industry. And I think here it's really clear you have a you have a full cell, a practical cell, and you can really see the degradation mechanism. So in this way, it's very practically uh, coupled to 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 what you need to uh, to understand uh, for instance in failure uh, failure mechanisms but the same goes then to understand new battery materials if you look at uh, all the development now going from cobalt oxide to, to nickel rich materials uh, which are more environmentally friendly and can also enable uh, higher voltages all that all that um, the research, uh, to 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 understand how these materials work and what is the best uh, best compositions has really been underpinned by by uh, in situ and operando diffraction experiments by X rays and neutrons. Very fun. Oh, then we have also questions so from the chat. So I will maybe swap there as well. So from uh, uh, end card. Uh, so could you expand on the role of machine learning in fundamental in fundamentally understanding the mechanics rather than the modeling? Uh, no, but I can tell you what I would like to. <laughs> I, I think this is what we try to do in Big Map. I don't think this has has yet uh, reached. Uh, maybe I can say not reached the full potential. I, I don't think it has reached particularly uh, a large potential. But I think uh, fr from from data sets. That we generate with with really high precision and and from different methods where we know we have the same response. I think these could be really useful training sets uh, uh, for for machine learning to to then guide uh, guide simulation tools. But also you could, in principle, through machine learning and uh, and similar methods, also guide experiments uh and maybe on the fl use this for on the fly uh, analysis but as far as i can see it's not nothing that we routinely use today i think this has huge potential uh for the future and and something that that i think both facilities and universities need to invest in so maybe we on our side need to bring much more data scientists on board in our teams uh which we are not as as used to do uh, maybe a little bit similar, like the bio community has done in bioinformatics, where they bring also data scientists directly on the team with biologists and chemists. Maybe here in battery research, we need to bring in data scientists to to, to help us work with uh, with data. Indeed, so more looking at uh, the computing science huh, in in that, yeah. one. and as well the DMSC. So we didn't mention explicitly, but the data management and software center. Yeah. Capacity yeah. as well in uh, Denmark, and as well there yeah. are some, some idea to with uh, even the accelerator to use machine learning and to combine the methodology as well. So indeed, for understanding the um, the mechanism and the modeling, but as well the method used in machine learning, yeah. very important. Uh, so then we have another question, uh, um, actually a comment indeed, so using on uh, the 2D material. So we work on 2D material and we are looking for a thesis subject. Uh, so in which uh, we use a source of material in different applications, including batteries. So if you are interested, so you can then contact uh, Nagy's band. <laughs> so is there any, because this is stretching, this is at the edge, using 2D material. Do you see it feasible or what would be the, um, the, the challenges there? 
No, but absolutely. I mean, uh, 2D materials uh, are, are really on the research agenda also for, for uh, energy storage. And I mean, uh, especially for supercapacitors. So these are also energy, electrochemical energy storage devices. So not batteries, but with, with much larger and much smaller energy content, but faster discharge. Uh, their materials like graphene and maxine are really uh, introduced and and looked into um, quite advanced uh, application in advanced uh, research states. For batteries, uh, there has also been the the application of, for instance, graphene uh, as a conductive um, as a conductive uh, host, or or sometimes even uh, as a membrane for selective ion transport and similar. And I think there we just see so far the beginning, the problems are, are always the large volumes you would actually need for, for real applications. But on the, on the small demonstrator scale, there are many interesting uh, concepts on batteries and in, in all parts on the anode uh, for the coating of separators, on the cathode, this can also be as functional interlayers and so on. And not only, uh, and then you can go to the more advanced um, to the materials, uh, either with maxines or uh, MOS2 or similar, where you also sometimes can exploit some kind of, uh, let's say, electrocatalytic activity to increase the, the, the conversion rate, for instance, lithium sulfur batteries, or and in this way increase the capacity. So there are, there are tons of nice concepts in literature and a lot of research, but, but yet we need to, to advance to, to the real applications, but also the, the volume, the purity, the quality and so on of the 2D material is, is critical and the cost. That's good. And, and indeed, so calling for this thesis subject, so uh, to Nadia as well, I don't know exactly where you are based, huh? so maybe I can, uh, we can connect later on by email, but also I recall that in January 22, we had a uh, uh, from Singapore, so Professor Antonio uh, Cassonetto, who gave a presentation on uh, the, the graphene, and it's a perfect way to connect maybe and understand, uh, so Alexander, yeah. how such yeah. a thesis could be also sold, because we had those questions, indeed, looking at yeah. how, um, I mean, from the neutron point of view, we could yeah. do it, so your development uh, could uh, combine those questions. So thanks a yeah. lot. I think also for those so, who are interested in such work, maybe contact the Graphene flagship where uh, many of uh, many projects on energy storage are, are going on. And there you can find all the groups in Europe working on these topics, if you are in Europe. In Europe or elsewhere, that's the thing. In, yeah. Speak, yeah. In Europe, but as well, South America. Yeah. And... yeah. So then on, uh, so now back to the question and answer. So there is uh, one set of five questions, so which might be um, interrelated as well. So what are some of the challenges faced in battery research and how can large facilities, uh, so large scale facilities help addressing them? I can put it together maybe with the second one, yeah. how do large scale facilities for battery research contribute to the development uh, of efficient and cost effective battery yeah. technology? Yeah. I mean that, that's 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 what we have been touching upon quite a lot today. Is is that they provide really the tools for us uh, to 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 address key problems? Uh, everything from uh, how do interfaces develop uh, to what's the stability of materials? What are the processes going on? Even then to imaging of the full device. So so it's I, I would say it's it's they contribute over the whole part of the chain which is necessary for, for innovations uh, in battery technology, all the way from, from developing new materials to actually understanding new cell concepts and degradation mechanisms. The, the, so so, so, so it's, it's, it's really the Swiss army knife. It, it contributes over the whole chain. Which I would also put, indeed, as you said, the training aspect, uh, the multidisciplinary yeah. as well, of yeah. all of, and the political for the, the policymakers at the money and the yeah. support. So then, so what type of uh, large scale facilities are available? So for battery research and what type of specific uh, capability? Uh, so so, so, so the, the two ones I've spoke about are the neutron and x-rays facilities. Uh, and uh, I mean, they are, uh, unfortunately, as, uh, if you look at the map, you will see that they are mainly distributed in the rich world, which is maybe a little bit sad. Uh, so we can see that that uh, there is not so many facilities. Uh, there is no facility in Africa, even though the African light source is is hopefully coming on. 
uh, less facilities in South America and in uh, parts of uh, Asia as well. Uh, but otherwise, there are there are many facilities in Europe and all of them uh, in Europe and US and also in Asia, China, uh, Japan and uh, South Korea. Uh, and all of them can contribute to research. So it's not one special facility. And all of them have instruments which are more or less um, suitable to address questions uh, in battery technology. So it's more about if there is a community engaged with the facility, so there is knowledge on how to address the problems, if there is suitable sample environments, if there is knowledge on how to, as was also asked, how to prepare samples, how to interpret the data and, and to do the specific training you need for, for, for the battery, how to couple, for instance, electrochemistry to, to the experiment and so on. So it's, it's more about this. It's basically available at all of them, but maybe not all of them have has this as part of their own in-house portfolio. So the in-house portfolio and integration, as you said, in the community yeah. beyond. Yeah. With Academy GoNet connected as well to the industry to make it like um, some real innovation applied to, to society. It's an important part. But as you mentioned, indeed, I just want to recall that in the link that I sent earlier with those 30 different recordings, we have one also on the African Light Source, which is a project, and so a nice project, though, and one about the, the Sirius in South America as well, who is an existing operating uh, bright source as well. And... Uh, they're the one in um, the serious one in South America. I think it's really an interesting example how they combine all those different uh, multidisciplinary looking at from science with the industry being very involved from that construction. And uh, I think it was a, a good example how synergy between uh, those different um, uh, disciplines can bring uh, a, a lot to the academy, to the um, industries as well. So then uh, next, uh, uh, so how does the large facilities help researchers to better understand the fundamental chemistry and physics uh, behind batteries operation and degradation? Part also of what you mentioned, if we want to- I think we have discussed that a lot. Exactly. Already. So, yeah. so it's, uh, it will be okay. So how does, uh, so yeah. how do collaboration between research in large scale facilities to lead breakthrough in battery technology and accelerate uh, so the pace of innovation in the field? So it's also yeah. time. Yes, so we addressed this, but I, I think it's really central that you that you address the right problem so that the stakeholders, also industry, is involved in which questions we ask. Mm -hmm. And so that we are not only on the fundamental level, then we can also add to the innovation part. Uh -huh. And then to understand as well, so uh, from uh, Isabella Astro, how uh, for um, international undergraduate students, so to receive some uh, internship as well at large uh, facility, large scale facilities. So do you know any yeah. we can send maybe by email some information? Yeah. Yes, we should we should look at the specific examples. I know that some of them have. Uh have programs also for uh, undergraduate students and, and can receive people for internships. But, but it would also be a message to all the facilities that please develop more such programs because I think it would be really, really useful. And, uh, and to have them also broadly, so not only for, let's say, chemistry and physics, but also for, let's say, computer scientists and electrical engineers, because we need all these to develop uh, the good instruments, uh, the good data analysis, and, and so on. Yeah, and I will emphasize there as well as uh, an initiative between the French embassy and Sweden. So for the FASEM that you may have heard with the links in Lund, where for the, the first FASEM was about material and environment, exactly with batteries being one of the center. The next one will be on life science and biophysics. So, and we will alternate and, and get as well more momentum. So thanks to, to sponsor. So to give such type of connection between countries, I think uh, will be very important. Uh, so another question as well. So could you expand on the role of machine learning for formal understanding? So this is what uh, was in the chat. So I just uh, yeah. uh, mentioned that. And uh, how to recycle, uh, so use the battery. Ah. <laughs> yeah, so that is, of course, one of the most important issues today that when we develop more and more batteries. And I, 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 I think it's uh, too long to go into that now, but it's, it's a research field of its own. Uh, and the challenge is to to, to actually 
uh, harvest as many of the components and raw materials as possible. And, and I mean, when we started, when this started several years ago, th then basically the only thing which was recovered was, was the copper because there was value in it. But now that all the components like lithium and also some of the transition metals and so on are becoming scarce and, and more expensive, then also there is a recovery of this. So, but not only the recycling, but maybe also considering how to, to, to reuse components is, is very interesting. And I think also here, large scale facilities can contribute in that research. I think that's why it's sustainable. That's good. Yeah. So thank you very much. I think uh, this was a lot of exciting question, you see, so you drove a lot of attention so from our audience. And again, I recall I recognize you of the name from everywhere in the world. So that's really important. And we're in Sweden <laughs> and Italy as well. So thanks to, to Luisa, so in Europe, but we, we tried really to shine some of those spotlights everywhere. So thank you so much, Alexandra, for for all this information, everything is recorded and will be like our other, so call, um, I mean, colloquia in the web page that uh, actually I'm gonna share um, now. Here we go. So we have uh, uh, the link that I sent earlier. So you see here those 30 different websites uh, recording with a lot of information. I was mentioning this one with an observer from, uh, so this is the one in Sirius from South um, America in uh, Brazil. Uh, and then you can find the one, you can find all of them are very interesting. The one from Sweden, the previous one with machine learning. So there as well to get some synergy with uh, the Lund University in uh, this domain. And then uh, I will recall with uh, Luisa, so the other link that I sent is uh, to explain as well what we did with the um, APS March meeting. So it's uh, six uh, uh, different sessions that we had between March and April meeting led by the, the FIP, the Forum of International Physics, but together uh, with uh, other uh, units at the APS, we have uh, uh, for this session more than 12,000 people so who are really following uh, what the American Physical Society is doing. And uh, here I really recall the, 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 the wonderful work as well from this uh, Prima Pagina from the Italian Physics Society. Uh, and then uh, we will uh, so finish uh, this presentation. So maybe, Luisa, do you have a uh, more question or do you have? No, it's OK. Yeah, you, you are muted, but I think it's. Uh... I was saying thank you very much. It was very, very interesting and uh, full of information. So I think that. Thank uh, you. Well, um, we have to think about all the points that were raised, and it's uh, extremely interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really liked it a lot. The fact that this is recorded, and I think it's a perfect example for showing how Sweden can be active and how ESS as well can be uh, the, the focal point. ESS and Maxo, of course, but for this innovation and for industries here in Sweden and elsewhere. Uh, so then I point, uh, you see here, so the next uh, uh, colloquium, which will be the next colloquium will be uh, directly live from uh, Argentina this time. So it's the 25th of May, and uh, we will go back uh, to um, putting another stone as well from understanding the IUPAP, so the International Union for, Phys for Pure and Applied Physics, uh, uh, and how um, also in combination with uh, one of those six sessions that I was mentioning, uh, uh, being prepared in the March and April meeting. So we had uh, um, another session called um, K52. You can find this uh, in the, the recording as well of the APS March meeting, where you see there a uh, more complete uh, maybe presentation, but there, so Silvina um, will present uh, all the, the different uh, future after 100 years of IUPAP, how all this uh, vision will be uh, portrayed. So we are then looking forward to seeing all of you so on this uh, uh, channel. And thanks a lot uh, for this um, enlightening presentation. So thank you, Alexandra and Luisa for connecting.